So tonight, we're going to be talking about with the laid lady, Katie, and she's got the King's Goblet she's going to show us. But first, uh, I want to apologize for the sound quality on some of the videos that we're going to show tonight. Um, Katie spent about five hours working to create this piece, and I edited it down to about an hour and 20 minutes, so we're going to move through it pretty quickly with you. But I had some equipment problems when taping, and this was just one of those things where it seemed like every time I turned around, something went wrong. And <laughs> there was even one point where I had been recording with her at her shop for about an hour and a half when my heart sunk because I realized I had forgotten to push the record button. So <laughs> it was just like one thing after another. And oh. so we had, we had, yeah, so we had some uh, audio issues. I think we got most of them worked out on this um, things you're going to see tonight. You may need to turn your own speaker volumes up or down to um, hear it as well as you can. But again, if you're something you can't hear for some reason and you want some more explanation, just um, type it in, a question in the chat. Or when we go to those breaks, you can ask the question then because Katie will be back on and um, answering questions live at those break, quest break sessions. So as an intro for her, <clears throat> Katie's fairly new to wood turning. She got her first lays for Christmas in 2017 and started turning in the new year of 2018. She fell in love with it immediately and discovered a passion for creating wood. wood. Katie loves the process and loves learning about it. And I'm excited to say that she's now teaching her 13 year old daughter to turn. So that's awesome. So here we are, uh, Katie Vitale. So Katie. So. Hi, everybody. I'm, I'm really honored to be able to participate in this and I'm humbled by the request. So uh, please ask any questions you want. Um, several people were always available to me to ask questions and um, I'm not the expert, but I'm happy to answer what I do know without further ado. <laughs> okay, we'll move in. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is this is um, creating the epoxy blank. If I can get this slide to show, there we go. And that was the blank. It kind of goes resin, wood, resin. It's like a, a barbell, whatever, a dumbbell. Yeah, exactly. So what I did is I made a form for what you can see in the middle there to attempt to get the wood to be um, like hard and penetrated with the resin because I could tell that some of it was punky. So I wanted to coat it first and then also eliminate any kind of waste of the resin. So I just saved those containers, the, you know, anything like uh, beef jerky or whatever, and um, hot glue the the blank down to the bottom, and give it like an air vent because it it will actually boil and give you exothermic cracks. So that was the um, first pour that I did was the wood, and then the second pour that I did was the bottom and then I flipped it over and then did the top and the end result was what I was able to turn. I'm gonna start turning it and get a tenon on it. Always use very sharp tools when you're doing resin.
just going to lower my tool wrist a little bit because I don't feel the cut that I want. But you can see this nice smooth cut. That's what you want to see on your resin. You just follow the bevel and keep the handle low and real smooth. Don't push real hard. push too hard you can find that you get big chunks or shards that fly off and um, that's okay I guess if you're roughing it up but you're gonna find that you have a lot more cleanup and your turning experience isn't as enjoyable I find for resin so I like I enjoy the process uh, I enjoy I enjoy the setup and the turning and the sanding, the finishing. I don't enjoy getting things done quickly. I want to watch it be a fine job. So I take my time and I find that safer as well. I'm turning at about 800 RPM. But that bump right there, or the rattle, that's air. The higher speed that you turn at, the less you'll feel that. But also you have to weigh how safe you're going to be, how fast it is. So I got some of the weight off on the front, and then I'm just going to move down to this end and get a tenon. I may use some of my carbides to uh, shape it up a little bit. But the Mike Mahoney uh, roughing gouge I use almost exclusively for a lot of different um, uses because it's so versatile and it's such an excellent tool. It's well weighted and it um, is really sharp. So I love these these tools that I have. sharpening my tool for time sake. Carbides are they work great for resin. You should just barely apply any pressure when using the carbide. So for those of you that haven't made a goblet before, I don't know how many of those haven't. I mean, you haven't, but the first step in making the goblet is not to shape your stem and your cup and everything. The first step should always be to keep as much bulk as you can here, because if you're going to try to gouge out 
the goblet on the inside, you want to have as much support as possible in the in your center, especially when your weight when you're far out on and you're gouging out here because you need something to hold on to it. So you, you basically have all this overhang and it's, it's going to be too much for it to hold on to. You could use a steady rest or something like that as well, but um, you want to have that support and that bulk and weight. So don't, don't ever make a stem before gouging out your goblet. Um, I'm just going to check the size of my tenon here. I think it needs to be maybe a little bit smaller. fit in there or you could have like a pre-measured uh, little template that you use um, you can see I have some chips that went flying here the carbides are really really sharp you cannot push hard but I wasn't too worried about that because this is not going to be the end shape right here um, also resin you can get air bubbles and that will happen as well They'll I'm flying off where there was an air bubble if it cured too quickly in that region. Um, I think my tenon is, is just about there uh, and then I'll be ready to turn it around. not what we wanted. Come back. Oh, this is some oh, real great. wood. And See where we were here, because <laughs> Katie, you are cursed. <laughs> it's, she was, it's, it's, the, it's the Katie show. Yeah. <laughs> where did we stop here? Let's see. That didn't, that wasn't the end of that, I don't think. Was it? it was almost to the end. Was it almost it was, the end? It was okay. right at the tenon spot, so it might have been. Oh, it might have been. Okay, I thought there was one more thing, but yeah, I think you're right. I don't think you are cursed. <laughs> 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 yeah. So we're going to move on to um, shaping the goblet then. When I get down this pump here, you can actually take the carbide and rotate it and get a really nice smooth cut. Just like you would rotate a traditional tool. And you can feel the bevel the same way. So they tighten. But that's all I'm doing is sort of following the curvature. And go to the next step. Maybe not necessarily with carbide. But I was able to apply it well enough. And then when I started using traditional tools, it was it was sort of a seamless um, transition because I already understood the concepts that you would apply for the carbide tool with a traditional tool. But I wish I, I would love it if I found somebody that understood how the catch would occur. They say, go with the grain. And to somebody that's new, the grain is turning. So I don't know how you go with the grain. And, um, and it's probably soft stuff there. You could hear it and then you can bring it out. And so when you, when you go with the grain, 
I don't know how you use the one. So, I don't know if anybody else says it's sort of, I guess it's a little bit of a cheat to hollow out stuff. But if you use your Jacob's Tech, you just hold it. I don't have any like real technical way of doing it. I just either stick a finger in or my pencil and it just kind of eyeball and it's worked so far to not make a funnel to see how deep I am. Um, but I know I want to stop right around here so that I make a typical goblet. So I know I have like I'm about halfway there. And you can use calipers, and my dad is insistent upon using calipers. He's a perfectionist, and I like to strive to be a perfectionist, but then when I'm doing it, I'm never <laughs> that perfectionist about it. I don't know if this matters at all, but I'll tell you guys again, I'm, I'm turning, I'm doing this at like 800 RPM. The other thing that you need to make sure you do, which you guys probably already know as well, is um, always make sure that your material is coming out. Because otherwise the thing will get stuck in there. It doesn't have any way for the material to like leave. And that's not fun. And it goes down to about right here right now. So I could go in just maybe a tiny bit more. And then the other thing that I always make sure I do is go in just above where I want my bottom to be because I don't want to have this little point there. So I know I'm going to have to go deeper than this point at my bottom. So I go in just above where I want my bottom to be. Unless I guess, of course, you're doing a vase and nobody's ever going to see the bottom, but that's, that's my strategy. So this is the, uh, the hollowing tool that I use most frequently. Um, let me show you the Simon, or that's the Simon Hope. Let me show you the Robert Sorby one. It's a lot larger, and I know I was describing the head before. This is the little head. The carbide tool is way down here. And it's a bigger, deeper um, angle. You can see how that big scoop. But then there's this head here, and you can adjust it in and out to how much, uh, it, you, how, how aggressive is the explanation that he gives in the instructions, how aggressive of a cut you want to have, so how much is exposed of this uh, blade right here. And you can see how much, how deep it is of, of a carbide. So look here. And it does take out quite a bit of uh, material if you get it in there. But it is, it is really, I mean, it's kind of a beast to hold, for one. But two, um, the last time I used it, I actually ended up sitting on my lathe in order to get the angle that you have to do to get in there. And um, I figured out how to use it well enough, actually, with the help of Dwight. So thank you, Dwight, wherever you are. Thank you. And uh, he, he just explained a lot of different things, uh, the hollowing tool, without even knowing what it was. But you have to hold this tool perpendicular at the bottom. And then when you're coming out on the side, this little angle here, you have to make sure that you absolutely hit your, uh, your piece right there and nowhere else. Otherwise, you get a catch that's just whoop, that constantly. And it, it's, it feels, I don't know if I'm the only one or anything, but it, it feels scary. <laughs> it makes you jump. <laughs> and, uh, but I was, I was persistent. I continued, and I know how to use it. 
it is an excellent tool. This one, the learning curve on it is much easier. Uh, again, you want to go in perpendicular at the bottom, and it's and it's almost a dead on center at the bottom, and you're scooping it, and then you'll come out like this, and uh, you're cutting on uh, this edge right here, and you'll see here how much it, it's able to. Uh, hopefully, you'll see it doesn't fly off or something really embarrassing. Um, you'll see how how effective it is. But I just love the weight distribution on the tool and the way that um, the ease of using it. So hopefully I didn't babble on too much. I'm just going to check to see where it hits. And that feels about perfect. Um, the very first thing that I'm going to do is thin this out a little bit. And then I'll come up from the bottom and come out. So that feels about perfect though for the depth. That's the other really cool thing about carbides though is, um, you know, they're, they're taking off just a, a small amount of material so you're not really given much force. You shouldn't have to really push hard. They're really, really sharp plays obviously, but um, there's, there's the it could be known as the ladies tool. goes from resin to wood, resin to wood. It's, an, it's a neat, interesting feeling. I 
thickness right here that I'm going to take out and then I'll be at the bottom and then I'm going to leave Oh, I'm going to leave enough so that I can continue shaping this inward. Because this is not the end shape that I'm, I'm going for. I hope that, that makes sense. Um, but I'm, gonna, I'm not going to go so thin in here that I don't have the ability to continue shaping out here. Um, Color. It would be really neat. It's gonna look like wine. Just what I'm going for. So that's cool. <laughs> I keep sliding on my floor. Okay, so we're going to stop for questions here. If anyone has any questions on us so far, let me get into the chat and see. We do have some. Um, Katie, there was a question get to the top of the chat. Um, does the epoxy smell bad like acrylic? Does it melt if turning too fast? Um, so I haven't noticed that it is. It is. It has a similar smell. If you, if you compare epoxy to acrylic, there is a smell, but it's not like an acrylic. Um, and I find that it's not uh, as pungent. It does get warm as you're cutting it, the same way that you would notice um, something else with friction getting warm. It doesn't melt like acrylic does where you it needs water in order to sand it. So, um, with anything though, I think if you hold sandpaper in place too long, it will eventually burn just like wood would, will. Um, but the, I haven't found that to be a, an instance of epoxy where you need it to be wet sandpaper like you do with acrylic. Um, and I certainly didn't find any similarities with brittleness where it, it can break and shard away. That's more to do with uh, maybe bubbles or curing process or how you're cutting. Whereas with acrylic, it's, it's very brittle and the more force that is put on it from the quill to the headstock, it can crack a lot easier um, just in tightening it. And uh, the epoxy will give a little bit and, and actually yield. So um, it, it, I haven't found it to be the same kind of brittleness at all. Um, it's, it does ribbon off but it's a soft ribbon. It's like a spider web, really. It's sticky. Whereas acrylic is like a hard ribbon and um, it definitely doesn't have as much give with, with I've only used it for pen blanks really, but um, it's, it's an easier material, I think, to um, be forgiving with. Okay. I know Shan asked in the um, chat and you answered him, but so everyone else can hear it and see it too. Um, what's the name of the smaller hollowing tool that you use? That's the uh, Simon Hope hollowing tool. 
And um, there is a, a vendor that is, I think you have to be certified basically to sell uh, the, the Simon Hope carbide and the tool. Otherwise you have to pay for it to come overseas. Where's it, Nate? And I have the, the guy's contact. He, he sent like a little magnet and a thing with the hollowing tool. But the hollowing tool, Simon Hope is in England. So oh, okay. he's, an, he's okay. an exclusive. Okay, cool. So um, is there anyone else have any questions? You can just unmute yourself if you do or raise your hand either way. I got a question. Oh, how Dave. Come how come uh, you haven't used a pressure pot? get rid of your bubbles you know i just got one for christmas <laughs> and uh, um i have yet to get some thick set resin uh the sticker price on thick set resin is kind of high <laughs> so i haven't put out the funds to um get some and then make a project with it to use the pressure pot when i had some fast set resin so I just decided to use the resources that I already have before I endeavored in using the pressure pot. But I did get one for Christmas and I'm excited to use it, but cautiously excited because I've never done it before. <laughs> and I think that piece was pretty big. It would be barely fit, I think, in a, unless you have a really big pressure pot. I think. It's pretty big. It's a five gallon. Yeah, but that was a, that was a pretty good size piece. It was. So, and it yeah. won't, even a pressure pot won't necessarily take out um the bubbles i've read some people that do resin exclusively on youtube and they're talking about like you have to use a vacuum pot and then use a pressure pot in order to yes. cure it yeah yes that's correct okay so there's always going to be some variable i think if you do the pressure if you do resin was there any other questions anyone had i no. i have one uh, what for a thick pour what resin do you recommend so I think for a thick pour, you, you want to do a slow set and do the total boat. Okay, my, question has to, my question has to do with the Myrtle wood. It looks like it's like maybe three or four inches square. Could you get by with something smaller or do we need that when we're doing the way out on the goblet part, the cup bowl part? Do we need it thicker to keep it maintained? Oh, I see what you're asking, I think. So because of my weight of the, the resin, did I need that center? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I'm a cheap guy. So that was a lot of myrtle wood. It looks like it's gonna get thrown on the ground. So I was wondering if you could get by with a smaller piece of wood or no. You know what, I wouldn't recommend it. I wanted the weight there and it was actually just a piece about this. Well, I don't know if you can tell how big that is, but it was maybe, 10 inches, but it was only an inch thick. And it was actually, um, it was like maybe two inches thick, but it was like a crazy kind of live edge slab. And okay. I didn't know what else to do with it other than, so I ripped it and then I flipped it in half and um, like put it together back to back as a mirrored image basically. So that I okay. had two, um, two straight edges and then the live edge down the center. And my original thought was, oh, I'm gonna have a really cool like stem where the live edge goes through the resin and then it comes up to the goblet. And what ended up happening was I got some of that in the goblet and all of that in the, or the stem. But there was, as far as waste goes, that was minimal for sure. Okay, great, thing. Okay, let's move on and we'll, we'll get some more questions after the next round of Showing you where we're at. So, oops, no, it went back one, isn't it? Now this is shaping, that's the goblet, okay. No, you're there, standing. I was standing. standing. I was standing, okay, I wasn't sure. I thought I, I missed one, okay. I think I missed the first one. That's why I'm nervous about <laughs> missing any others. Okay, here we go. So this is everybody's favorite part, I am told. <laughs> I know I'm right about here, which is perfect because I'm going to curve in right here, make my stem. I'm going to keep this my widest part. I'm going to shape this up a bit more. But first, I'm going to sand in there. Um, 
so what I do here is I'm going to start actually pretty low because I can see I have a lot, quite a bit of um, markings from air bubbles and pockets and whatnot. Um, and I just go with the rotation. So I put this in right here and I allow it to move it. And then I pull it up like this so that I am not going against the turn. And I actually love getting these sanding discs because obviously I can use them for two purposes, but also they're way cheaper because you can get them in a huge stack with varied um, grits, like from 40 all the way up to 800. And I get them on Amazon for like 20 bucks. And there's like, I'm gonna say 150 pieces. Um, there's a ton and they have the Velcro backing and everything that you would need for your sander. Um, but they work great. And then I don't have to buy, um, you know, tons of packets of contractors packs of all the different varied grades. And in between grits, I just take the time to uh, clean it with eating cured alcohol. And you get an idea of, uh, you know, how pretty it's going to be. It flashes off real nice. Uh, it's not going to make your wood swell. You can see, I don't know if you can see actually, but I can see uh, where I need to sand more and before I go on to the next grit. Right in here where I have this like air pocket. Also, when I do the um, resin finish, it will cover up like quite a bit of like small scratches if they're, if, you know, throughout the sanding process if I don't happen to. So it's a nice way to um, finish a piece. Not, not to say that you don't have to sand it, just that, um, some of the markings it will it will actually fill in nicely. My daughter is uh, 13 and she recently decided that she would like to start to wood turn. And uh, we're doing homeschool. So she's lucky enough that she can actually, as high school, she can do that as an elective. And I got to thinking about how many kids actually have the opportunity to have at their home you know, a wood lathe and shop equipment if they wanted to do wood shop. Um, I don't know that any, how many schools even offer wood shop anymore, but I know mine didn't. And uh, she started turning on my little lathe over there. And it's kind of neat to be able to give her some amount of instruction and have her uh, enjoy creating. I was able to use her school funds um, for some wood and for some acrylic so she can do some pens. Um, but she started and she's got a cedar bowl. And it's just amazing to be able to see that it doesn't mean you got to be like an adult before you can find the passion and participate in creating. The way you can see it coming together and I'm only at uh, 120 grit is just so exciting. Like each stage of it gets you closer and closer and you just take that time to put in the finished product.
You really don't need to push hard. That's something that I learned <laughs> probably many times the hard way. You push hard and you start to burn. Um, that's not the point of sanding, obviously, to most people probably, but uh, I, I was under the impression when I first started that the harder you push, the more pressure you give it, the better the better it's going to be and that really doesn't help it sand better when you give it more pressure um when you use something like uh the shine juice which is like a shellac and um denatured alcohol and linseed oil that is a friction polish and you're going to warm it up with the heat of, of using it but that doesn't mean that you need to push hard and um really apply too much force. It just means that you need to continue to use the uh, polish in place and friction. And it'll get really a nice shine. Sometimes when I'm sanding, if I find like on a piece of wood, I've got a particularly troublesome spot, I'll just turn it off the lathe and I'll go at that spot and go with the grain into it. And I find that that saves the aggravation of sitting there and going constantly. I had this one bowl, it was a three pointed bowl that I glued up and it was a cube. And it was a project that I really wanted to try out. And it was made of, uh, actually, I called Dwight on this one too. He'll recall if he's here uh, <laughs> because it was glued up of cherry and poplar and um, walnut, I think, one other wood. Well, when uh, the poplar, when I was doing the sanding, it sanded great and it felt really smooth. But then the poplar at the heart of the wood once I put on this uh, oil, it went kind of fuzzy and it turned this really strange color and it did not look good at all. And it was just really aggravating and disappointing to me. Um, and I couldn't figure out why, you know, just at that one spot on that, uh, on that wood, it kept, um, reacting kind of to the to the oil and um dwight pointed out that you know at the end grain i've got separate types of wood glued up but on that particular one it it probably i probably would have benefited from just using like a sanding sealer before putting on my finished product which is um exactly what I went back and did because had I not that bowl would have had this really strange discoloration just at that one particular spot and it had nothing at all to do with the sanding because it was all completely smooth it was just the that right outside of the pith the heart wood um on a poplar grain goes green and then it goes some variation of green and then it goes white well it kept turning brown which wood is brown but it was a, it was an eyesore for me so there's the perfectionist that came out and um he said you know you can get rid of that if you want to take the time sand it all down again which i did and then put a sanding sealer on it and then put your finish on it and uh it just came out beautiful came out great that's and that was exactly what i needed to understand was that that step um, but really different wood products and different woods. That's one of the parts that I had to really wrap my head around was all the different finishing types, whether it was oil-based or water-based and what, what you apply with each type. I do know that with resin, you can't apply any oil 
because if you're going to do an oil, then you can't do a resin finish. They just, it won't work. Um, and I know that if you're going to sand your resin, you can't use any kind of wax because if you're going to um, do a friction polish or a resin polish, because what happens is the wax, if it doesn't completely get off, which I mean, no matter how much you buff it, you're, you're going to have some wax still there. That's the whole point of putting it on, I think. Um, you're going to get streaks. And that's really unsightly. So don't use wax when you're going to use a resin finish or an, a friction polish finish. So like right there, the teeny tiny little bubbles, I'll, I'll just take a little bit of dust and I'll fill it with CA glue and it won't look bad. At least that's what I'll tell myself. And I guess I, I want to do this sanding and finishing on the inside first because it's going to be really difficult to sand, even though it's just sanding, if I have a thin stem. And it's way, you know, out here. You, you still need the support. And I just actually empty out my DA sander and I save it all in this uh, bowl of dust. And it works great for just using fine filling. I've um, actually created fillings before, like wood filler with um, a little bit of wood glue, the sawdust, and then a tiny bit of water. And that works great too. It's basically like a wood putty. Um, it's really strong. But this dust is so nice and fine. I've used coffee grounds before and they look kind of cool. Well, if those are my only defects, then I did okay, I think. It looks really pretty. It goes right with the uh, curvature. I can't wait to see this piece of wood sparking up. Just make sure whatever sanding filler you're working with isn't an oil base. If you're obviously if you're gonna put it on before the resin. So myelin's just excellent. I don't know if you guys can see it. There. <laughs> <laughs> not sponsored yet <laughs> um but this stuff is just amazing it's really excellent it goes on really nicely it flashes off really well it must have like some kind of alcohol in it um i know it does have some amount but it's uh great for sealing up it dries really well Sands really pretty. I mean, they must have gotten it right. Established in 1884, specifically for wood turners. All right, I'm going to move on now to shaping the exterior. Oh, so what I like to do uh, is take the quill and then I put this came on a. Uh, one of my tool um, packaging. And I thought, oh, that's perfect for putting on the end of my quill so that it doesn't get rammed in there. And then I, I use a half of a tennis ball as well. And it, <laughs> um, it makes it nice and soft to go inside there and uh, not me leave any markings on my freshly sanded and sealed piece. Uh, and it also provides the support, which is exactly what I want.
And then I just make sure that throughout, I stop and uh, check when I'm shaping this, you know, where I'm at. Um, it's, it's, it's pretty thick right here. Because I, I said I wanted to make sure that I left myself enough to taper it downward. Um, so I'm not, but I, I do stop frequently and just check where I'm at so that I don't destroy my goblet. I'll get that nice and tight in there. So I don't have any wobble. And I like to hold the tool right here at my side as a starting point and then rotate inward. So you're just kind of going downhill. I can still go more tapered right here. But my depth is good right there. So I'm going to continue this shape. What I'm doing here, is this isn't like an actual parting tool, I'm making relief cuts because it's a diamond shape. So I will go in and I can't actually get as deep as you could with a, with a real parting tool. Um, I can do nice beading and nice details and curvatures but I can't get as deep as you could with the traditional uh, parting tool. Luckily I haven't needed to go incredibly deep or do that kind of a cut really. I've worked around it. I would like to get a parting tool. That wood does not look like it got penetrated by the resin. Still feels a little bit punky to me. So that'll serve well when I 
put resin on. Oops. Technical difficulty, hold on a second. On top of it, it will be protected and be nice. But right here is going to require quite a bit of sanding. You see right there, a little pocket formed, which is fine because I'm going to be turning it down more anyway. But that's what the what you hear sometimes chipping away. And I really want to smooth this out and get it nice and uniform shape. So I'm just going right now for the curve that I, that feels right to me and that complements the the natural um, transition from the wood to the resin. So I don't like things to be abrupt. I like things to blend well and um, to have soft lines. I'm not um, too good at like abstraction, but I it feels good to me when the lines are smooth and when it blends well. Probably keep tapering from there just a little bit more. I like how big it is. And I like the way that it transitions here pretty well. I'm going to go ahead and work on that more. Oh my gosh, that was a big chunk that came out. I'm going to have to taper that really well. That had to have been a nice big pocket right there that caught. So design change for the taper right there. The resin, they said. It'll be fun, they said. I'm wondering if I want to go lower to expose more of this or if I want to keep it like that. That's what I'm thinking in my head. I know I have to come down a little bit more here because I have that chip out. It's like the beginner set, the uh, the square point, 
the round point and then this diamond point are like, you know, everything that you could ever want to do or need to do as a beginner, you could do with those three tools. You could turn a bowl, you could do this. Um, for a long time, those were the only tools I had. And in fact, I only have those other couple of uh, bowl gouges. But um, this one definitely serves as like your detailer. The other square point one I use a lot for um, shear scraping or for creating the steps like I demonstrated before. And then the round nose one is, is really a, a wide variety of uses, but it's, it's the most versatile tool probably. Um, this one I know I mentioned in the last video is useful for the dovetail cuts for your tenon or for your mortise. Uh, I really like it because of the fine details that you can get in on. They've got a really good weight distribution. See if that chip is out. Yay. I think I'm gonna do like a skinny to to wide base. I'm gonna taper it down so that it's sort of like a old fashioned looking uh, goblet. And you can see, I don't know how well you can see, but this is where the two pieces of wood came together. And there's some teeny tiny little pockets that I'm going to have to go back in my sanding process and um, fill up with some sawdust. That is the shape, and I like that. Smooth out this uh, bottom part, and then I think I'll be ready to sand. And I will do the same process that I did before. I'll start at a low brick and move my way up. Just take my time. I made that detail cut right there because I knew that was the depth that I wanted to get to to um, blend to. And so I should be. My detail cut is gone. I do that a lot. I'll make I'll make just like a lined cut, and it'll be like a marker for myself, especially if I'm doing like a a plate or a bowl that um, isn't like a complete circle that where you have like a live edge. It, it was pretty difficult when I was first starting off to know where point was that I wanted to start gouging in and so I would work it with my detailer and then I knew from there in is where I want to gouge and create my bowl. Um, a good way of looking at it when you're doing a bowl that's like that that's the, a platter or a bowl that's uh, not where you're doing like a live edge is to know that where there is air you won't see the whole piece. So you'll see gaps um, and, and the where it starts and where you can actually see center is obviously where it's all solid, but um, it, it can be difficult to know from a starting point where you want to start gouging out. And so a detail line 
just a, a one little cut will help um, start you there. This is the shape. I think it looks good and it's proportionate for handle to goblet to base. Um, it's maybe a little bit thick here, but not not so much that I have an issue with it, I think. I could taper it in more, but I kind of like the shape. So just kind of one of those things, I guess, personal preference. If Okay, we're going to stop sharing here um, and go about to some more questions. Um, I don't know if we have anything in the chat. Somebody asked how long you, oh, what was the sealer? And you said myelins to them. Uh, oh, somebody asked about denatured alcohol. Katie, did you want to mention that? Yes. Yeah, so uh, recently, like I went into Home Depot, I think in 2020 at some point, and they said that, yeah, uh, they're not allowed to sell denatured alcohol. And I don't know if that's just Home Depot or all over California, but I assumed it was all over California. So I just order it from Amazon and they ship to in my house. <laughs> okay. As Carlos asked, uh, he missed the beginning. He said, what kind of epoxy are you using? Uh, epoxy resin. And I used a, um, a quick set, a one-to-one -one ratio. And Gary asked about the sealer and you said Mylans, you did your nice uh, <laughs> display of that. And someone asked how long you've been turning. Uh, so like almost three years, I would say, yeah. And how did you get started? So I just, I got started, it was a Christmas present uh, from my dad and it was really quite a surprise, but it was, Definitely, I, th I think that maybe that didn't make the final cut because it was such a lengthy <laughs> story <laughs> uh, in in our video process. But uh, you know, we were redoing my deck, and uh, my dad is just one of these guys. He's incredibly patient, and he taught me so much when we were redoing my deck. And it was then that I heard the term lathe. <laughs> And I, I said kind of girlishly, it, it sounds like a potter's wheel, but it goes the other way. <laughs> uh, you know, that was, that was in the summer and over Christmas, he called my husband and he said, you know, what does Kate want for Christmas? And um, Sal looks at me and he goes, your dad wants to know what you want for Christmas. And I was like, more than anything in the world, I want a lathe. And uh he, I called him later because I was really worried that he would go and spend that money and I didn't want him to do that. And lo and behold, he did. And <laughs> uh, I'm really, really grateful to him because it, it afforded me this, this opportunity. And, and it's just a wonderful thing to, to have. He gave me my grandpa's um, lathe tools, which is something I didn't even know he did, but you know, it's really special. My grandpa was a wood turner and I don't never even got to meet my grandpa, but to have his tools and to be able to pass something on maybe to my kids and um, do the wood crafting is really, really very special to me. And I have my dad to thank for that. Oh, that's awesome. Are there any other questions in the audience? Anybody wants to unmute yourself and ask? Okay. So we're going to go on. Um, the next one we're going to do is putting on the uh, final epoxy because you saw the sanding on the inside. It's basically the same as what she did on the outside. So we didn't feel there was any need to <laughs> show you even more sanding. So uh, that one we're going to skip and um, start right away with it being back on the lathe. So let me get to that. Oops, that's shape. Here we go. I want to apologize in advance for this hair day that I'm having right here. This is not normal. <laughs> uh, 
Hey, you haven't seen us yet, Katie. Don't worry about it. <laughs> so uh, right now, this has a couple of coats of sanding sealer. And um, it has flashed off. And I'm going back now with just a real light touch, uh, 800 grit. And I'm going to sand it. And then I will clean it with denatured alcohol. And uh, then it will be ready to um, put the resin uh, finish on. And I'll demonstrate that. Um, I'll show you what I have mixed up. This is uh, just a two-part epoxy and it's clear and what I'll do is brush it on with a silicone brush so that um, it easily peels off once it's cured and they're reusable that way. Um, just a real light coat of it and then I'll keep the lathe on actually for about 12 to 14 hours on a very low speed like 50 RPMs and uh, until it cures so that I don't get any um, dripping and it'll be completely uh, dry to the touch, no stickiness or tackiness. Um, so if you look really closely, you can see some amount of uh, really fine, fine markings that were from the cloth marking on the, um, the sanding sealer. And so I just go back with, with a very fine grit and brush those off and then clean it, as I said before, and then I will finish it. So I'm just really barely applying any amount of pressure. I'm just barely touching it. I don't want to apply any force. I just want to let the sandpaper do the work again. And I'll get a real fine dust. This process really doesn't take too long. It's just kind of the details again. I'm not sure if I introduced you to my handsome husband. He's uh, actually filming the finish. Say hello, Sal. <laughs> <laughs> He's normally not so shy. Okay, so you can see if you zoom in here, just the real fine markings, and then I'm gonna clean that up. see what it's going to look like. I think the real question everyone has is how much a beer will that hold when it's done? Well, it'll definitely be a King's cup. Okay. Now I'm going to get the resin and then I will just turn the light on over here. So I, another good note to mention, which you guys probably don't really need me to tell you though, is uh, something to protect your bed rails because resin is really sticky and not that enjoyable to clean up. Um, you can clean it up really easily with denatured alcohol, but still getting drips everywhere is not advisable. So 
these little brushes or spatulas, I guess, work really good. I don't have to worry about how messy it is or how much I'm glopping on there because I'm going to go back and just like you would kind of decorate a cake, you'd go back with a real light touch and get all the lines off. And I don't know if anybody is interested, but the dollar store has like a lot of supplies that are <laughs> reusable, like the silicone or the mats, like, a quick like the, where you have the cutting um, so mats and stuff. They're great for resin. Getting it on and getting it perfect very quickly. So what are you putting on there, resin? I couldn't hear you very well. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a seal coat of resin, so that it's mm -hmm. it's like rather than using your finished coat of uh, um, lacquer, or rather than using a shine juice or a Frenchie's shine, you just use a resin seal. And is it a two part product? Yeah, it's a two part epoxy. It's the same stuff that I used to pour it. It's just now I'm using it to finish the piece. You're filming right now? Uh, I can't wait to show this to my dad. He saw the uh, goblet before, obviously, before it was finished. And uh, I can't wait to show him what it turns out like. I'm really hopeful that um, it'll turn out nicely with the finish. He made some really good um, pointers to me or about um, putting on sanding sealer and the application of it. And um, something I didn't really realize about sanding sealer was the application of it would really matter if you were gonna do a brush on or whether you were gonna do uh, a spray on. And he said that um, when you do a brush on application or a wipe on with a cloth, you'd have a tendency to leave uh, streaks and to um, leave those markings on your, on your product. So a spray-on application is a lot cleaner and um, you can, you can um, eliminate maybe the, the I guess the, the stroke marks um, and maybe one of those um, steps that I have to do in um, before actually applying my finish. Uh, so I, I'm really excited to see uh, how this turns out and, and what he thinks of it when it's done. Uh, are you filming? So what I'm gonna do is turn it off and make sure that I didn't miss any spots. I'll do like a little touch up spot where I see anything that like somehow didn't get touched. 
and then I, I would turn the lathe back on. A couple of little tiny spots that um, didn't get completely covered. And then what I will do is once I'm assured that, or I feel confident about the coverage that I have on here, I'll turn the lathe back on at a very low speed, like 50 RPMs, and I'll use a torch and uh, warm it up just so that any, any bubbles that do happen to get through are eliminated. And um, then just let it cure. The most difficult thing is not touching it, even though it looks so pretty and you think maybe it's done, don't touch it. Let it cure for a good 12 hours, especially if you're just doing a two-part epoxy resin. Um, if you're doing like a thick set, a two to one ratio, that would require 24 hours, maybe even longer. The temperature outside really, really does um, affect your cure time and um, how quickly it will cure. And then also if you um, maybe don't mix it properly, that would obviously affect it. This part especially, I'm gonna make sure I do a nice clean brush. And it's just, I mean, it's totally obvious if you miss a spot, so you, you just wanna check. It's sticky and it doesn't flow as well. spots out here. Now one thing you do want to make sure you don't make the mistake of doing is turning your lathe on high because it's going to spin everywhere and then you really have resin everywhere. Uh, it's not what we want to do. <laughs> well, unless you're into that sort of thing. So I'm going to go back and just kind of scrape it, essentially. So it doesn't curtain. That's a good question. Does it require treatment? What's the uh, maintenance procedure? You mean once the finish is cured, once mm -hmm. the resin is cured? When the project's complete. So I wouldn't recommend putting it in the dishwasher or anything like that, um, but just soap and water to clean it uh, after use. And um, since it is resin coated, you know, it's, it's going to be basically waterproof. Uh, I would caution against leaving it out in the sun because 
resin is reactive to UV, even even though a lot of resins say now UV resistant, it, it could yellow it a little bit. I don't imagine anybody that has this or takes it will leave it out in the sun, but you know, um, that's something that you wanna be aware of if you do anything that's resin coated. Um, other than that, it's, it's very durable and um, you can shine it up real pretty and clean it real nice with like any kind of um, product really once it's once it's cured it will scratch so you don't like if you make a cutting board um it's it's definitely food safe but it you shouldn't cut on it just love the way that like when it's completed you can see through it and it's just so pretty Hold it up to the light. I can't wait to see like wine in this. All the colors that I added to it, I used mica powders and I used alcohol inks um, in several different pores so that I wouldn't have just one color. And the way that they mixed up together was really pretty. Okay. Well, I'm just going to torch it a little bit here. And you don't want to get right up on top of it. And um, that's kind of all there is to it. I'm giving it some heat. Resin loves heat. So do I. That's why I married my husband. Um, the only other thing I would say about this is you want to keep it clean, okay? Bugs sometimes are very attracted to wet resin. <laughs> um, luckily, I haven't had too much experience with that. And, um, you know, keep your environment as, as clean as you can, so don't be turning or doing something else as it's uh, finishing while you're letting it cure. But other than that, thanks. How did you finish the bottom? Uh, so the bottom, I just parted away, um, cut it off and um, painted on resin at the bottom. Are you trying to talk, Chris? You're on mute. I saw your lips moving. But... Thank you, Katie. I I had a cough and I muted myself, which I forgot. <laughs> Thank you, Katie. So yeah, I was just wondering, um, did you use a power sander at the bottom of that or did you hand sand it? No, I just put it on top of a belt sander. And after I, I parted it off, there was, it was just like a tiny amount that, you know, needed to be flattened off. So I just Hold it there. Got it. Oh, cool. <laughs> and, uh, smooth it out. All right. Anybody else? Go ahead. Can, can you wet sand versus um, applying acrylic or or the the resin over that? So uh, if you were like uh, with your pin blanks, you know, you wet sand it. Is it possible to do a wet sand versus applying more resin to it? Yeah. So I think we skipped over that. Might have gotten cut out because there you can finish a resin piece in a couple of different ways. And I wanted to maybe if we have time, can I talk about that? Yeah, go ahead. So you can do one of two ways, right? You can do um, a wet sand and um, it doesn't have to be wet, but you can do a wet sand with um, your, your process being sand it, sanding sealer, use a, a, a 
um, a grit, like a, a wax grit, and then use a shine juice, okay? And you can put that on top of a resin piece and it'll be really shiny. In fact, the piece that I wanna share today, that's what I did with it. I didn't do a resin finish. Or your option would be to sand it, sanding sealer, directly to resin. Don't do any wax, don't do any oil base because the resin won't stick to it. So you have a couple of different routes, the same way that you have other routes you can take is, is what you want to do with your final product, I guess, um, or what you think would benefit the best for your, your piece. With this particular goblet, I wanted to do a, a resin coating because I knew that the wood down the center was gonna be a, a lot nicer if it was resin coated than it would have been if I had tried to sand it and do like a shine juice or something of that nature. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Good. Yes, any, thank you. Any other questions? Good job. Okay, well, thank you, Katie. We really appreciate thank it. You. So one thing else that I wanted to point out too is, I don't know if it came through in that, is that if you're going to finish with resin, you absolutely should always use a sanding sealer because it it eliminates the bubbles and it helps to 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 seal it like what it says it's supposed to do. If you don't do that, you'll get a lot of um, like spots on there where it doesn't coat it. Okay. 